So all the silliness is, as usual, our segue to talking about Martin Buber, Mr. I and Thou, or perhaps better translated or differently translated, I and You, because Thou has these weird archaic overtones, whereas in German it's Ich und Du, and Du is just the familiar. So if you took Spanish or French, you'll know that there's a You formal and a You familiar in those languages, and Thou, I guess, was the last time we had one in English. So the point is talking about these intimate relationships. (laughs) <laughs> which are uh, generally not sexual, but he doesn't discuss that. I think the thou is not such a bad idea as a translation, just because it captures, you know, this strange, I don't know if mystical is the right word, but this sense in which he's using it. Well, certainly the first translator thought so. I think he yeah. took the time and a footnote to explain his reasoning behind thou. Oh, really? Okay. Well, and I think it was it, it fell in line with what Mark said, which was that it's the very fact that thou was the last time that we used a kind of intimate right. um, yeah. symbol for you, that he wanted to make sure that that got in there. So it was sort of a reverse of Kaufman's, who was the subsequent translator's argument, that it made it sound too formalistic and less intimate. Yeah, and Buber does talk, though, about language and, and primitive societies and the way you know that if you go far back enough, you have these... We're jumping ahead a little bit here, but these relational sure. encounters, as opposed to what happens as we go on and it becomes more of an I-it experiential relation, and then we can start defining those terms now, I guess. Sure. I think a topic area summary would make sense in advance to letting Daniel loose on a biography summary, which might go on for 15 minutes. I promise I will Who skip knows? it. I'm trying to tone that down, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's a skill. Your level of preparation, Daniel, is dangerous. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think it's more pathology than skill. So I'm, I'm trying to work. I'm in therapy, trying to work on that because I can feel the expertise sort of just brimming out of you. But yeah. <laughs> well, that's the way guests are supposed to work. No, and I say this as someone who's over prepared for episodes, and then I can say in this episode I compliment you by being spectacularly unprepared. So it's good, good to have someone who's really prepared. <laughs> We like having fans for guests because we're reading something every three weeks and the guest usually has like four months notice to just stew right, (laughs) and to read everything that they can. And we made it more intense for Daniel this time, even though he was already stooped in Boober and was, I think you had suggested the topic in the first place. That was definitely one that was on our long-term list, but we had a not school group that then you participated in and I nominally participated in. (laughs) where Daniel then put up lots and lots of links and we got to pre-discuss this with some PEL listeners before coming on here and got to hear people's perspectives on, is there a secular version of Buber? He's known as the Jewish existentialist, but do you need that part? Or is he giving a psychological explanation? Or how does this relate to Merleau Ponty and Heidegger and other phenomenologists? And, you know, there are lots of things like that that we're not going to go in detail here about but are kind of cool and good preparation for this. And you mentioned Kaufman. One of the sources that Daniel had recommended to me was Walter Kaufman's, it's like a three-volume book on continental figures. And it's not the kind of survey that you would expect. It's very opinionated. It's not even that helpful in terms of understanding Buber's language. Yeah, he just rails against Buber. (laughs) Yes. As somebody that he was very influenced by and appreciates and says, look, you can't dismiss the guy just because his central point about the centrality of I and thou and his mutual exclusion, uh, I and thou and and I and it, those are the, his two word pairs. And he thought that was fundamentally screwed up. But still, there's a lot of good stuff in there. In Kaufman's defense, and I'll admit I'm biased just because I'm a huge fan of Walter Kaufman's writings, Kaufman was an actual formal student of Buber's. And it's clear that they actually had a very strong pedagogical relationship throughout their life. So perhaps in past episodes, we've talked about the relationship between Wittgenstein and Russell. It seems to me that there was a similar kind of pattern over the course of their relationship. And it seems that toward the end, there may have been, I don't know if I'd call it a falling out, but perhaps a gradual distancing away. And I think sometimes Kaufman's relationship to Buber is not necessarily one of condescending aloofness of, well, it's cute for what it is, but here's how he gets it all wrong. I think he loved Buber, and I think he loved Buber's works enough to try to take it seriously, but sometimes taking it seriously means describing in detail what you find wrong with it. But I would say in some ways, Kaufman really took Buber to heart, that he explicitly tried to adopt it as part of his pedagogical practice at Princeton. And by the way, I apologize to the entire listening audience if they're not familiar with who Walter Kaufman is. I was trying to promise we weren't going to be name dropping, but Walter Kaufman, I think, is a still a well-known, famous Nietzsche scholar and scholar of 20th century existentialism. 
known for a lot of different academic and I think public writings trying to bring philosophy to popular understanding as well as to academic understanding. Probably most people know him as a translator of Nietzsche. That's right. And this is relevant. I'm going to make this relevant to the audience <laughs> retroactively. Kaufman is known for his translation. And in this chapter on this Discovering the Mind book, where he covers Buber and many other figures, he says that he owes his whole theory of translation directly to Buber. And this is very relevant to Buber's entire project, that Buber was not only a philosopher, but one of his big things was translating the Hebrew Bible in a actually kind of unreadable way, apparently, but <laughs> <laughs> and was very had this theory of translation, which requires kind of a personal connection of hooking up. So when Kaufman translates Nietzsche, why his Nietzsche translations are so famous is because he really uncovered the style of Nietzsche and resisted the temptation to simplify it and make it very breezy in English and tried to capture what it's actually like to read Nietzsche in German. And so mm. that was apparently directly under the influence of Buber and this concept of understanding the other and dialogue. This is at the heart of his philosophy. Where it gets complicated is just in this work, I and thou, the relation between me and the other is this sort of primal, wordless, indescribable, mystical thing. Whereas then, as he goes on to develop it in the rest of his career, it really focuses more on dialogue, which obviously uses words and is not, doesn't have the same dynamic as this fleeting I and thou primal mystical experience. But before we get into that, which translation are you guys using? I use the Ronald Gregor Smith, which I guess was the original. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what I'm using. Same here. And just to be difficult, of course, I was going through the Kaufman <laughs> translation, although I've got a secondary source that has a lot of comparative quotes between Smith and Kaufman. And from what I can see, they don't radically differ. It is really just more a matter of inflection and style. But it's telling that you see that in Smith, he actually tries to translate words like doppelganger into English, whereas Kaufman is content to just let doppelganger be there, because I think it is kind of impossible to try to put into English. So you see in Smith a very literalistic style of translation, which I think actually has uses. And so I've actually kind of walked back from my feeling that Kaufman's translation was necessarily superior. I think they both have strengths and weaknesses. Mm. Well, Daniel, before we move on, I just wanted to ask how you became interested in Buber, because this was your suggestion. Sure. I came to Buber through Kierkegaard. So back when I was on my Kierkegaard kick, I was trying to read as much as I could in the secondary literature about it, because uh, my opinion is it's almost impossible to really divine what Kierkegaard is getting at, sheerly just by reading the works alone. I think we're just too divorced in time and history and place. But in the context of reading the secondary literature, I came across Buber's essay called A Message to the Single One, which appeared in his essay collection Between Man and Man. So it was in the context of reading that and seeing here, here's someone from a Jewish tradition that is trying to make sense of Kierkegaard and taking it seriously within his own context that made me realize that, well, perhaps you needn't be this kind of tortured New Testament-obsessed Protestant Christian to be able to make use of Kierkegaard. Here are people who are, you have not only the secular tradition in the form of Heidegger and Sartre making sense of Kierkegaard, but you also have someone from the Jewish tradition making sense of it. Buber himself apparently had read a great deal of Kierkegaard as a teenager growing up, and a lot of what appears in Kierkegaard, and, and to some degree even from Fear and Trembling and Sickness Unto Death, which we discussed in earlier episodes, you can see those influences even in I and Thou to some degree. But I don't want to get into an exegesis on, on Kierkegaard. But anyway, that's how I got there, was really ultimately trying to get a grip on some of these religious existentialists. I see. And really, to be honest with you, it was really more through the essays. I mean, I think to anyone who's frustrated by I and Thou in its, one might say it's poetical lyricism, but others might say it's somewhat oracular obscurity. If you were to read his other essays, you know, the essay collection Between Man and Man, or he has a, uh, a bound collection of lectures that he gave called, I think, The Eclipse of God, those are much more readable. I think, Mark, one time you made a comment on the Hegel episode that you really can't get away with the nonsense if you're addressing others in a room, right? It kind of forces you to be coherent. So that's a good segue into the text and, and into this I-thou versus I-it distinction, which we've made enough jokes about now that... <laughs> Anyone who hasn't read this is going to be baffled. <laughs> we should say, yeah, what that's about. Let's just read the first chunk here, the first quarter of a page that sets it forth so you can hear how his style sounds. His sort of fake Nietzsche, fake Bible <laughs> style. <laughs> to man, the world is twofold in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words which he speaks. The primary words are not isolated words, but combined words. 
fuck stick is no sorry uh <laughs> the one primary word is the combination i thou the other primary word is the combination i it wherein without a change in the primary word one of the words he and she can replace it hence the i of man is also twofold for the i of the primary word i thou is a different i from the primary word i it there's nothing like mark's sarcasm <laughs> to bring a uh mystical text <laughs> back down to earth <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've mentioned on any of the other episodes, one of my friends was saying that, you know how like a pervert can make anything sound sexual? That's kind of the definition of a pervert. Mm. That he accused me of being able to make anything sound stupid. <laughs> 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 so think of a good word. Think of a sniglet for that. That might itself be a good translator's talent. Yes, you should read like uh, one of Einstein's papers in that tone of voice. <laughs> <laughs> e equals MC squared. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, one of the critiques of Kaufman's translation was that in trying to inflect that style, it, it actually comes across as a little bit more ridiculous than it might otherwise do. So I think it's interesting in the context of talking about I am thou, the importance of translation, because as was mentioned earlier, Boober, to the extent that he had a professional career, it was really as a publisher, as an editor, as a translator of other works. So really, whether or not it should be I and thou or I and you is kind of relevant to the entire discussion and how we're to go about reading this. Right. We should say that the things that he is famous for besides this is, you know, he's known as a Jewish scholar, but he was not in the tradition of rabbis talking about the rules and the, he kind of disdained the whole scholarship part of Judaism in some ways, at least large portions of it. He's very well known for translation and commentary and things on traditional Hasidic tales which is a branch of Judaism that's against the rabbi culture, that is more down to earth. The Hasidic tales are meant to just be homilies to appeal to individuals. So it was kind of one of Buber's ambitions to create a new version of Judaism that would be very commonsensical, very understandable, very down to earth. It would not be stuck on ancient Jewish law. It would not be stuck on even the infallibility of the scripture. The scripture is something to have a dialogue with, that the people who wrote the scriptures were religiously inspired in the same way that any of us can be religiously inspired. So if it says something offensive in the scripture, don't try to create some crazy legal interpretation of it as the rabbis did to avoid having to inflict horrible punishments or whatever. Just say the people writing that didn't understand God in that particular instance. So it's very anti-authoritarian. So he's kind of like Kierkegaard was to Christianity, eschewing the formal priesthood the religious leaders in favor of, you know, your own personal conscience and your own interactions with God. Yeah, I mean, they were both against dogmatism. Yes. One thing ironic I find about the biography of Buber is that his grandfather apparently was a very famous Talmudic scholar, but he himself was really a product of secular Vienna. And in fact, he, he really was not a particularly devout Jew in his teen years. He'd sort of wandered away from traditional Judaism into exploring into Eastern religions, Eastern mysticism, Christian mysticism. So he really became a student of world religion. And philosophy, read Kant's prolegomena at age 14. <laughs> yes. Well, that's exactly right. And I think it's interesting to note that the reason why he apparently was so taken with Kant's prolegomena was that he was, as apparently as a young man, tortured with the idea of space and time as infinite concepts. The idea of infinite time apparently gave him this uh, horrible sense of headache and angst. And you see something of this in Blaise Pascal. If anyone's ever read Blaise Pascal's Pensee, I think there's some section where he talks about how contemplating his existence against the infinite field of the universe uh, fills him with a sense of certain dread. And apparently, and again, I'm basing this on the secondary literature I've spent way too much time with, but Buber was attracted to Kant because once Kant explains that space and time are really just human intuitions that come from faculty psychology, he realized, oh, well, then maybe what I'm experiencing is just more of a phobia based on, upon a misunderstanding <laughs> rather than, you know, a genuine reaction to what ought to be this horrific nature. And hopefully this builds into the point I was hoping to make, this ironic point, which is Buber really is a product of the modernity that he criticizes in I and Thou. If he had been in a more traditional society, I can't help but believe that he probably would have gone to yeshiva, that he probably would have been raised in a more elitist Talmudic law-based tradition, and would not have been given the intellectual tools with which to come up with this more stylized, poetic, kind of lyrical, non-dogmatic interpretation of the text. And, and this is because he studied at the University of Vienna during this kind of fantastic turn-of-the-century intellectual explosion. So 
I think in, in section two of the book, you know, he's criticizing aspects of modern society and how it creates an alienation of the world. But I do think in defense of modernity that I think it actually gave him the tools with which to come up with this kind of creative interpretation in the first place, because he was steeped far more in the German philosophical tradition than he ever was in the Judaic Talmudic tradition. Yeah. So let's say what these two primary ways of relating to the world are, the I-thou versus the I-it. Seth? Seth usually brings us back to the text, but I thought I'd bring Seth back to the text. <laughs> I appreciate that. So the I-it relationship is the relationship of what we consider to be a traditional subject to a world of things that it experiences and uses. So he actually uses that language where he says that the it relationship is a relationship of experiencing, of using, and that experiencing can take the form of perception. It can be an emotional or a feeling. Mm -hmm. It can be conceptual. So the process of carving the world up into ideas or having a world of ideas themselves is still a form of treating ideas like things and objectification, if you will, in the subject object sense of that word. And that this is pretty much the standard way that human beings interact with the world. The I-thou relationship consists in the relationship to the other term, I guess would be one way to say it. He doesn't use that language because he's talking about God or another human being. But essentially, it's where you stand in relation to the other thing, not as trying to experience it, not as trying to use it, not as trying to understand it, conceptualize it, but to be in the relation in a manifest presentness. And we'll have to spend some time unpacking what that is. But it's important to just note that when he says that you stand in relation in the I Dao construct or relationship, you stand in relation to something, it means something different than saying you have a relationship to your desk or your computer or your car. It's a different meaning of the word relation. Yeah. And it can be to, it doesn't just have to be to God or other human beings, right? It could be to nature or to some artistic project that you're working on. Potentially anything. Well, yeah, potentially anything you can have an I-thou relationship with and anything you can have an I-it relationship with. And usually our relationships with other human beings or even with God have kind of devolved into this I-it mode. And the I-thou mode ends up actually being quite fleeting, although we'll get to the point where we see that one of the reasons that people turn to a concept of God is to get beyond this fleetingness of the I-thou relationship when it comes to nature and to human beings. So my best sense to make sense of this initial I-thou experience was it's the time before subject and object come apart conceptually. It's the primary starting point, just like for Descartes, he starts philosophy by, you know, sitting in his chamber, meditating on the world around him. And then we had criticisms like in the past episode by Robert Persig in his Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where he said, no, that's already mistakenly pulling apart subject and object, me sitting here looking around at stuff. And so we've got a whole tradition around this time, starting with Hegel, maybe, of people that try to say that Descartes was wrong, that that's not the primary thing. And so Heidegger had his, we start in the world, we're already immersed in it. Well, Buber's version of that is this. The primary thing is being encountered with your whole being by another. And he, he does talk about a child in the yeah. womb, right? Just to get at your point, Mark, about, yeah, this before separation yep. thing. He explains that that's the origin of the desire for the IU yeah. relationship, that babies come straight from the womb already trying to search out meetings with others, that their attempts to explore their world are really not necessarily attempts to cognize it, but attempts to try to meet it. But of course, yeah. the structure of our psyche is such that we tend to objectify, we tend to classify first. And that's the mode we, I think, as Seth mentioned earlier, that's the default mode with which we are stuck. And that IU is really more rare, it's more fleeting, and theory, it could never happen. Yeah, the IU mode is when all your needs have been met, because the other right. mode is really about meeting your needs. It's really focused on survival. Right. So in the womb, you know, all those needs are met. You're not searching out your needs. And then I'm not sure if he thinks it works this way with a newborn. But to the extent that all of those needs are simply being taken care of by a parent, you know, a newborn is curious, essentially. The way they're relating to the world is, I think you just put it, Daniel, and paraphrasing Boober, seeking out these encounters or these I-thou relationships relationships as opposed to trying to get other people to meet their needs and that I it thing which we all sort of lapsed adults can easily fall into even with our human relationships. 
Right. So, I mean, again, for anyone who hasn't read the text and, and they're just trying to figure out what do we mean by I, it, and I, you, or I, it, and I, thou, just to tie it back to what Mark had said, it seems like it's the difference between cognized reality and precognized meeting. And you see these themes in Taoism. You see these themes in Schleiermacher. I'm not sure if this is discussed at all in any of the other texts. Did Freud ever get into this? Because frankly, I got to tell you, there were much that reminded me of Freud as I read through this. Oh, yeah. There's Freud all over this. And psychoanalysts, including Freud, love to talk about this state before subject-object differentiation. Right. And his I-thou-I-it distinction parallels Freud's distinction between what Freud called object instincts and ego instincts. Ego instincts are all about survival and object instincts are all about love, which is something that Buber will treat as another paradigm of the I-thou relationship. But love and sort of an ecstatic relationship. And then, you know, we see the same thing in Nietzsche with Apollonian and Dionysian. And then at the political level in Aristotle, you know, where you have the focus on survival in early societies versus focus on the good at the level of the city state. I take this basic distinction and I think about all the other stuff we've read and how it sort of crops up in those places. But I think you're right, Daniel. It's definitely there's a psychoanalytic influence here. Right. I also think that this I thou encounter is Buber's substitute for Hegel's primal master and slave oh, yeah. coming in contact. So the idea is that you sort of start and you're absorbed by this object. This is the curiosity you're talking about in this primal instinct. And it's not really differentiated from other objects in the world. You're not thinking about its qualities. You're just absorbed in it. And it is often a person. It could be your parents. Or even if it's not a person, he talks about, you know, the teddy bear and things. We not only reach out for encounter, we project. He says, neither of these acts is experience of an object. This is page 26. He's talking about reaching out to the woolly teddy bear or getting entranced by your carpet when you're a baby. Mm -hmm. Neither of these acts is the experience of an object, but is the correspondence of the child to be sure only fanciful with what is alive and effective over and against him. This fancy does not in the least involve, however, a giving of life to the universe. It is the instinct to make everything into thou, to give relation to the universe. The instinct which completes out of its own richness the living effective action when a mere copy or symbol of it is given in what is over against him. That's all to say, we think of this, and certainly for Hegel, it's with another person, and that is the paradigm. And so even when it's not with another person, it's like it's with another person. It's like we imagine it's with another person, but he doesn't want to denigrate this imagining. Like, that's just part yeah. of the encounter mode that we come at right. the world with. I think that point's very important because Hegel is, you know, like a psychoanalyst might do. On one interpretation, he's trying to give an account of how we develop self-consciousness, let's say a psychological interpretation. Mm -hmm. And what's crucial in that account is the way in which the recognition of others and our consciousness of their consciousness of us, that sort of reflective mirroring back and forth is what constitutes us as a consciousness. We can't be a self-conscious human being without that mirroring relation to other humans. Human beings. And this is something you'll see in not just psychoanalytic literature, but in mainstream psychological literature when they talk about early childhood development. This concept of a, a mother's mirroring is really important to the development of the child's psyche. And in a sense, the child has to internalize. You know, we do the mirroring for ourselves after a certain point. We internalize it. But in the beginning, it has to be an other. So I think that kind of mirroring relationship, there's something now, I'm not sure if that's the basic distinction between I-thou and I-it, that in this I-thou relationship, you have this mirroring function, because speaking of Hegel, at different stages of that master-slave struggle, right, you could be in a kind of...